The Narcissist Thief Who Stole the Scream Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. My channel is about narcissism and psychopathy, as you know. And not only do I talk about my worldview, the worldview of my kind, the various dynamics that exist, but I also examine various real-life narcissists and psychopaths to help you understand more about the way that we function. I know that many of you find this very helpful by having real-life examples of the various behaviours, dynamics and manipulations about which I speak, as it gives you added understanding, not only in terms of why did this person behave that way, and ah, so that's why they did as they did, but also that with certain concepts surrounding narcissism, it's easier for you to envisage them with a real-life example. I've recently been examining Lucy Letby, who has behaved in a covert fashion. As you know, I don't like the term covert narcissist because I find that it's way too wide. With my specification, a covert narcissist could cover lower mid-range, middle middle range A, middle middle range B, upper mid-range, lower greater, middle greater, upper greater and ultra. And there are vast differences between those types of narcissists, and therefore I discourage the use of covert narcissist. It's appropriate to talk about covert behaviours, that's absolutely fine, but the term covert narcissist isn't really that helpful. However, I'm going to provide you with an observation now about somebody who's far more overt in their behaviours, that their narcissism is worn with a badge of honour, that it's a source of pride almost. The individual isn't an aware narcissist, but explaining about their behaviours and what they have done gives you more understanding about the various types of more overt narcissists. Overt narcissists will also include lower lesser, middle lesser, upper lesser A, upper lesser B. Some upper mid-range narcissists have overt behaviours, ditto lower greater, middle greater and upper greater and ultra. And therefore, it's important to understand what those overt behaviours manifest as. It was one of the most audacious heists in the history of art. When the footballer, Pal Enger, masterminded a plot to steal Monk's The Scream on the opening ceremony day of Norway's 1994 Winter Olympics, he triggered a cat-and-mouse caper that involved the Norwegian police, global media, and Scotland Yard specialist art squad. Accordingly, already there, there's a demonstration of a sense of entitlement, asset appropriation thus showing a lack of boundary recognition, a lack of accountability for behaviour, an absence of emotional empathy for those affected by the theft, and of course, the grandiosity involved, which would please certain narcissists because of the notoriety and fuel generated in involving various agencies such as the Norwegian Police, Global Media and Scotland Yard Specialist Art Squad. Three months later, the 28-year-old who played for the club Valarenga was arrested in an undercover operation in which two British officers posed as a buyer at the J. Paul Getty Museum in California and his minder and he was sentenced by Oslo City Court to six years and three months in prison. In an interview for a documentary entitled The Man Who Sold the Scream, Enger, 56, has described how he planned the theft of Norway's Mona Lisa during an earlier jail stint, reading books about burglaries, tapping up his fellow criminals for knowledge, and learning about alarm systems, metal and glass cutting. Thus this individual engaged in the planning of the heist alongside character trait acquisition. It also, of course, he'd been in prison before, demonstrating a collateral consequence of his narcissistic behaviours. Speaking in a mixture of Norwegian and broken English, without a hint of remorse, he boasts, by day, I was a professional football player at the best club in Norway, by night, I was the best criminal in Norway. Notice the grandiosity of that declaration explaining that he was playing for the best club, which arguably would be correct. But how would he know that he was the best criminal in Norway? 
Norway, of course, does have a very low crime rate. And therefore, I suppose there would be a suggestion that you haven't got too many to choose from. But nevertheless, believing that you are a country's best criminal demonstrates an inflated sense of self, uh, grandiosity, exaggeration, and boasting. Enger grew up in Oslo's impoverished Veta estate during the 1980s with his mother and violent stepfather, which would, unlike, which would likely be a lack of control environment, which was instrumental in the formation of his narcissism. And in this environment, career options were limited to crime or sport. By the time they were teenagers, both he and his friend Bjorn Gritdal, who owned two snooker halls, were criminals, with connections to gangs all over Oslo. This criminal behaviour also might have been demonstrative of conduct issues linked to psychopathy. I did so much crime in my 20s that I had everything. Note again the fact that he's completely brazen about the repeated commission of criminal acts, which shows a lack of emotional empathy, lack of boundary recognition, a lack of accountability, a sense of entitlement to boast about this, and a complete absence of empathy for the way that he's behaved and a lack of remorse. Cars, boats, everything I needed, money, the most beautiful woman in Oslo. Again, notice this grandiosity of boasting. I was the best... I was playing for the best team, I was the best criminal, I had the most beautiful woman in Oslo. But I wanted more. I always liked attention. Note the need for fuel. I wanted money and fame, residual benefits. But at that time, I most wanted to show the world I could pull off something huge, a nice stunt. According to Enger, he first became obsessed with the scream when he visited Oslo's Monk Museum on a school trip and was drawn to it because it reflected his own feelings about his unhappy home life, character trait acquisition. He would visit the gallery a couple of times a week to see the painting. I was obsessed with looking at that picture, he reflects, long before I ever thought of stealing it. He first tried to steal the painting in 1988 when he was 21, but ended up taking another monk painting, the vampire, after breaking the wrong window in the gallery. I remember the disappointment lasted for days, he complains, but then it started to become fun. We hid the painting in the ceiling of the snooker club. The police came there in the week to play pool. I said to Bjorn, every time they're standing there playing, they don't know it's hanging just one metre from them. They are so close, but they didn't know. That was the best feeling. So note how he delights in the fact of the knowledge of people being so close to the painting, but they weren't aware that that was the case, that he was gaining thought fuel in that regard. So we let them play for free just to have them in there. I wasn't on the police's radar at all back then. The police didn't even have my fingerprints on file, nor Bjorn's. Some evenings, we'd hang the picture on the wall and play. Police offered a £150,000 reward for the return of the painting, but Enger ended up handing it in because he claims an informant, Jan Kvalen, turned him in. I had to hide, he says, really hide. They were looking for me everywhere. I couldn't go anywhere. It was hell. I handed in the vampire because I thought I'd get a shorter sentence, but it didn't help. Notice his self-preoccupied attempt to nullify the threat to control posed by his criminal activity. He and Enger spent the next four years in prison on different wings, but he was undeterred. When the president of the International Olympic Committee, Juan Antonio Samaranch, announced plans to host the Winter Games in the Norwegian ski resort Lillehama, he seized the chance. I thought, you'll be out of prison then, he says. There'll be almost no police in Oslo. This is a perfect chance. I learnt so much in prison. The other prisoners, they call me the asking man, because I asked all the time, how do you do this? How do you do that? How can we do this? I read about metal, what you want to use when you're breaking in with these metals and how you break things. I checked alarm systems and new, crim and new alarm systems. Before I was an ordinary criminal, maybe, but by the time I left the prison... I was an expert. To coincide with the Olympics and put them on the international map, the National Gallery decided to hold an exhibition entitled Monk in the National Gallery. Enger scoped the gallery for months, lying on the roof of a bookstore opposite it, watching as the guards drank coffee in the basement. When I come out, the plans start for real, he recalls. The first thing I had to do was to go through the entire museum and check all the exits, check where the alarm sensors were, what kind of sensors. 
Some sensors I could fix so that they would not work, but these were too high up, so it had to be a kind of smash and grab. He then befriended a homeless man, William Asheim, whom he met in Central Station, teaching him to cut the window glass and giving him driving lessons so that he could steal the scream and anger could distance himself from the crime, recruitment of a lieutenant. Finally, he checked the glass was not bulletproof by tapping it with a spoon. With glass, you have to check beforehand if it's breakable or not, he explains. The best way I have learnt of doing it is to take a steel teaspoon and knock on the glass. When I tried that method on the National Gallery window, I nearly broke it with the teaspoon, so I was 100% sure that it was not bulletproof glass. On the night of Friday, February the 11th, in less than a minute, Asheim scaled, the, scaled a ladder, broke a window, and wrenched the screen from the wall, leaving a note which read tauntingly, Thank you for bad security. He then handed the painting to Enger. Note that the Enterprise utilises that taunting also, the triangulation. I used a whole day to take it out of the frame, he recalls. I was so careful. I held it with new gloves while I was doing it and I didn't touch the picture. As the police began a high-profile investigation, Enger played cat and mouse with them, believing he was untouchable. Note this concept of being invincible fits with magical thinking and his grandiosity. He even posed for a picture for the newspaper Dark Blada inside the gallery, beside the space where the scream had hung. The headline announcing the birth of his son read, Oscar Christopher came with a scream. Again, triangulation. I felt I was really untouchable by the police, he brags. I knew they couldn't get me for anything. However, his notoriety began affecting his fellow criminals who were being watched, and he began to feel intimidated, carrying a gun to protect himself and his wife Mia, a hairdresser, the paranoia of the narcissist. Eventually, he got in touch with his old friend Gritdal and asked him to negotiate a ransom for the picture. He roped in a petty criminal, Jan Olsen, who contacted the renowned auctioneer and art dealer, Aina Tora Ulving, saying he'd access to the painting through his underworld contacts. Meanwhile, Oslo police had teamed up with Detective Chief Inspector John Butler, then head of the Art and Antique Squad at New Scotland Yard, who devised an elaborate sting, claiming that the J. Paul Getty Museum would be willing to pay a ransom to get the painting back in return for exhibiting it. After verifying the authenticity of the painting, Butler set off for Oslo with an undercover officer, Charlie Hill, a US paratrooper in the Vietnam War, who was to pose as an agent for the Getty Museum and his minder, setting up HQ in a bedroom in the Plaza Hotel. After a series of negotiations, Hill collected the painting from Ulving's deserted summer house in Asgardstrand, the village where Monk spent the summer. Olsen and Gritdal, who were waiting for the ransom payment, were then arrested in the Grand Café in Oslo and charged with handling stolen goods. Enger was picked up later that day at a petrol station and was charged with carrying a loaded gun. Only circumstantial evidence linked him to the crime, but he was found guilty and got six years and three months in prison, Norway's longest ever sentence for theft. Gritdal and Olsen walk free on appeal. Yes, I'm guilty for planning it, admits Enger, claiming that Kvalen, one of the witnesses in the trial, had lied in court. But I don't cheat. They cheat. They lie and they say things to the court that wasn't true. I play by the rules. Notice again that delusion that here we have an admitted criminal who claims that he plays by the rules and blame shifting by saying that other people cheat. They don't play by the rules and the sentence was totally wrong. But one thing I like is nobody else gets sentenced for it and nobody else gets credit for it. It's my story. That's true. So, a brazen narcissist who took pride in boasting about what he had done and the way that he planned about it, and of course now he's drinking in the fuel from taking part in a documentary and interviews about what he had done. You can see here the complete absence of remorse. And although there is blame shifting, what he wants is the credibility for him being the mastermind behind it, that he wants the world to know that he was the one that had stolen the painting and that he was the mastermind behind it. Of course, he's not as clever as he thinks he is, as he ended up being in prison. But a useful example of the way that a narcissist behaves with regard to criminal activity. Not all criminals are narcissists, but many are, because of the absence of emotional empathy, the absence of accountability and behaviour, the failure to play by the rules, the necessity of breaking the law as a means to nullify threats to control and asserting control. The fact that 
A living can be made from criminal activity, which is a residual benefit. And therefore, many narcissists, but not all, are involved in criminal activity. We have the narcissist thief here, who stole the scream and still likes to boast about it, even now. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.